Good afternoon and welcome to the interview. I'm your host, Marie Daniels. Today I have a very special guest who is here to talk to us about the fight to save Valle de Guadalupe. His name is Scott Koenig and he is better known as a gringo in Mexico. Stay tuned. All right. Let me introduce my guest. Like I said, it's Scott Koenig from A Gringo in Mexico, and he has done some really interesting things this last couple weeks and has uh, stirred quite the interest in what's happening in Valle de Guadalupe. Uh, right now, Valle de Guadalupe is going through some changes. It is growing like crazy, and it's concerning to some of the people that love it as it is right now. Um, as you can imagine, any time any particular area starts to see a boom in business, they generally tend to also see a boom in interest from big business and developers who see dollar signs. So that is some of the concern that's happening right now in Valle de Guadalupe, and let's jump in with Scott. So, hi Scott, how are you? Hey Marie, I'm doing well, how are you? Very well, thank you so much for joining today. I'm so glad that you are able to be here. Um, My pleasure. And hopefully, you know, this live stream goes well enough for us to be able to make sure that we have a good connection. So uh, just so everybody knows, I am in Mexico and Scott is um, in San Diego. So he probably has a more stable connection in general than I do. So let's cross our fingers and hope that we, uh, uh, we're doing okay. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Helen. Hi, Tanya. Can you guys hear us okay? I love seeing our, our friends out there. We've got some thumbs up and we've got some little hearts there. Hopefully, Scott, you can see the comments also. Okay, not uh, yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I don't know about you, Scott, but I have, uh, I've got a nice big pitcher of water from, um, from our hosts here at Viaje. They know that I'll be talking quite a bit. No Valle Guadalupe wine? <sighs> Not quite yet. I'm still coming <laughs> off of that five-day fast. I might okay. have a glass of wine tonight, but I did eat my first semi-solid food today. I had a singular oyster, so that was something I couldn't pass up. You know it's my weakness, so. <laughs> well, as, as they say, one oyster is better than no oysters, but it does <laughs> oysters even better. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, great. Thank you guys for t letting me know that you can hear us okay. Um, have a little patience with us. We're going to make sure that we have all of our tech stuff set up properly. Hey, Joel, how are you? Good to see you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, so, Scott, you know, you spent yes. a lot of time, one, writing an incredibly lengthy and comprehensive article about what's happening in Valle, but you also spent a lot of time interviewing and speaking to uh, wineries and Provino and food pr pr uh, producers, etc. And you know the Valle better than a lot of people on state side, especially, and probably more than those that live here in Baja. Certainly me, uh -huh. and I and I get to claim Baja now as home. But um, give us a sense of what you felt is is sort of the strife that's happening right now, just as a big overview, and then we'll get into some details. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, Marie, let me give you a little background on myself in case anybody mm -hmm. out there doesn't know. Um, I have a blog called a gringo in Mexico .com. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been operating that for about seven years. I started in 2012. And then, of course, I've got all the affiliated social channels on Facebook and Twitter, uh, YouTube and Instagram. Um, the first time we went to Valle was in 2012. And we were actually down there on a tour. And uh, we were with a family from Mexico City on this particular tour. Uh, for the most part, people from the states, uh, the, the tourism had slowed down in all of Baja California a little bit post 9-11. Um, and then also because of some of the, the issues they were having with violence uh, around some of the border cities. Right. So the U.S. tourists hadn't quite uh, started coming back yet. Now, 2012 is also uh, when quite a few new wineries were coming online. I believe that's the year, first year that Finca Altizano, uh, Javier's Compestre restaurant, opened uh, in the Valle. And the food scene was really just starting to come into its own. Uh, so we were in the Valle. We fell in love with it. Uh, we fell in love with the food. We fell in love with the culture, uh, the experimental wines, uh, the, the beauty of the place, the nature, and then, of course, most importantly, the people. Um, so I've been reporting on it religiously ever since. I've had the pleasure of hosting a couple of filmed productions, including uh, the Culinary Institute of America in the Valle when they produced a series of educational films on it. Uh, and I've written a book called Seven Days in the Valle. 
Baja California's wine country cuisine. Which I so, highly recommend to anybody that's not seen it. It is fantastic. Oh, well, thank you so much. <laughs> I have a um, copy, and mine's signed. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, my, my family and I, uh, it's, it's basically the Valle is part of our lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a lot of friends there. Uh, we're down there at least once a month for a restaurant opening or an event uh, or just to relax and kind of hang out. Uh, again, we are enamored with the place. My interest in this, uh, I've worked with Provino for the past few years helping them and promote some of their events like Conscious y Vino Nuevos, uh, the uh, Vendimia events, etc. So when I saw eh, about two weeks ago that Provino and a lot of our chef and winemaking friends were starting to post about these regulations, uh, all in Spanish language, I was very curious. So I reached out to some of my people that I work with at Provino. Uh, they kind of filled me in on what was happening, um, which is essentially a set of regulations that have been sitting on uh, the desk of the, of the Ensenada municipality uh, since 2007 to 2010 uh, that have not been adapted into law yet. Um, the first, uh, and, the, and the regulations are, are really because uh, what happened is is after we went, then the Valle took off, as you know. It started right. being written about in uh, Mexican media. Then it kind of took off in international media. Uh, you saw it in Forbes. You saw it in Food and Wine magazine. And that really uh, inspired a lot of people to start coming and visiting the region. So, uh, And then American tourism started coming back at the same time. A, a lot of it driven by the, the culinary scene that was happening all throughout Baja California. So suddenly it went from when we went in 2012 for the first time, kind of a sleepy uh, behind the scenes little wine va- uh, valley uh, visited by people from other spots in Mexico, uh, locals, of course, from Ensenada and uh, aficionados, people who really like food and wine from the United States. So it went from that to a super hot or, as a lot of the press like to say, buzzy <laughs> uh, destination. And uh, what's happening now is that there's hundreds of, of uh, wineries online. Uh, there's hundreds of um, restaurants uh, that have now come online, uh, quite a few hotels and resorts that have opened up, and a lot of a- uh, Airbnbs kind of scattered throughout the landscape there. Right. And what's happening is that the region, uh, the Valle, is starting to reach overcapacity when it comes to natural resources uh, like water. Um, it's starting to, to hit overcapacity when it comes to some of the services and the infrastructure, uh, the road. Um, trash collection. Uh, they went on strike a few years ago. There was no trash collection at all in the, in the Valle uh, for the local people. Now it's it's kind of at a trickle. Um, fire started becoming a big deal as it is in our entire region here all around the border. And uh, really what's happened is the region has reached capacity. So the Provino, and it's not, it's Provino is a part of this, but the regulations were actually written up uh, by a group of business people in the Valle de Guadalupe in 2007, as I'd mentioned, uh, with the municipality of Ensenada. Uh, they sat on the desk there for throughout that administration. Uh, that administration turned over because the, the government in Baja California and throughout Mexico changes every three years. So then they were handed off to the next administration, unsigned. Uh, that administration didn't sign them, and so on and so on, and they remain unsigned. So what's happening now is you've got a group of concerned business people, uh, chefs, winemakers, uh, hoteliers, and other people in the Valle. Uh, and of course, the local population would like to see it kind of uh, retain its pristine condition as well. Uh, we're putting together a campaign to spread awareness of these regulations they've put together. Um, everything that they started posting on Facebook two weeks ago was in Spanish. So I contacted the people that I work with there, some of my friends, and a lot of my friends are behind this uh, set of regulations as well, and uh, volunteered basically to, be, to put something uh, in English language so the people here north of the border would know what's happening as well. Right. So if you can go to my blog, agringonemexico.com. Uh, I wrote a story last week that's basically a 3,000-word, mm-hmm. uh, a little lengthy, but a 3,000-word overview of what's what's going on there and some of the issues they're facing. I also uh, saw that you put a summary out after that because <laughs> I think yeah. it, it was a little intimidating of a read for some that, you know, that, that saw how big it was. But I read the whole thing, and I was really... Um, I was really enlightened as to how much of the complexity is there 
um, that I had just never thought about. And I think for a lot of people, if you aren't immersed in the culture and you just simply have gone, um, uh, you have just been a, a, a you know, an advocate in anything else here on the state side where we think of, uh, you know, sustainability and things. I think that you kind of forget when you cross the border and you're in the middle of that magical valley. You don't really think of the delicate, um, the delicate ecosystem that is the Valle. So it was fantastic for me to be able to read all of that and kind of get an idea as to what all the hubbub was about. Now, you spent quite a bit of time gathering the information to write that. Can you tell us a little about a little bit about that and who you spoke to and and what some mm -hmm. of the individual um, you know parties are are concerned about? Sure, um, Fernando Perez Castro, who is the president of Provino this year, uh, put me in touch with Eileen Gregory, who is. Uh, of course, with her husband, Phil, the owner of the winery Vina Cava right. and uh, the B&B &B La Via del Valle. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been in the Valle, I want to say, 18 years. Mm -hmm. uh, they just established their Mexican citizenship a few years ago. Um, so I, Eileen was an input for me, and they, they put her in touch with me uh, uh, because she's got a wealth of information, but she also uh, is a great English speaker, and my mi español is <laughs> a CSE. Uh, so I interviewed her on the phone for about an hour and I got a really good idea of what was happening in detail, whereas before I only kind of had a notion or an inkling of what was going on. Um, then I also spoke to my good friend Roberto Alcacer, mm -hmm. uh, of course from restaurant Malva, and uh, Roberto is not one to mince words. He will tell you exactly <laughs> what's happening in no uncertain terms. So I got a very honest uh, and direct uh, monologue from Roberto. So in addition to those two, um, a lot of my friends and people that I really respect uh, are involved in this movement, including Drew, Drek Drew, Drew Deckman, Deckman. <laughs> uh, uh, Diego Hernandez, uh, Alvaro uh, um, uh, from uh, Oximia is involved in it, uh, uh, Natalia um, uh, Badan is involved in it, and uh, I think even Hugo de Costa is involved, and I've started seeing uh, all of them giving these minute-long testimonials on the Provino Facebook page, and that really that. kind of sparked me to action because I, I I hesitated because I don't want to seem patrimonial uh, about Mexico or about the Valle de Guadalupe. I don't right. live there. Again, we're there all the time, uh, and I even asked Eileen what she thought, and she said, "Well, uh, you've got this following. Uh, you you are a person who loves the Valle. Uh, we've always appreciated the the coverage you've given us in regard to our food, wine, and culture. Uh, we would love it if you could kind of help spread the word." To our north of the border neighbors, so here I am. Well, fantastic. Um, so, when you were in some of these meetings and interviews, did you? Um, what were some of the key points that are, are concerning for some of the wineries and the current Airbnbs that are that are doing business? Sure. Well, one of the big ones um, uh, would be uh, there is a lot of late night events, uh, weddings, and a few cantinas online right now that have parties and loud music and, and light pollution uh, sometimes till two or three in the morning. And that's been a big issue from a couple of standpoints. Uh, the, the lesser issue there is light pollution really obscures your vision of the night sky. And if you've ever been in the Valle on a super dark night where there are no parties and no bright lights shining, uh, during certain times of the year you can see the Milky Way. It's, it's just a beautiful starry night. The second issue with some of these late night parties um, is the noise pollution. So you have a uh, citizen, citizenry, the local population, of, of which, by the way, there's zero percent unemployment in the Valle de Guadalupe for the locals. Which I, was, I found that was really interesting when you let me know that. I, I didn't even think about that. I, I hadn't either, but I mean, there's plenty of work for them to do at the vineyards. There's plenty of work at the restaurants. Uh, the problem that a lot of businesses in the Valle have is they can't find enough people to hire. It's the exact opposite problem than you'd think they'd have. So these folks, especially the farmers and the workers, have to be up at 5 o'clock in the morning and then out in the fields working by 7 a.m. So you can imagine if there's this nightclub or a restaurant that's having a party till 1, 2, you know, even up to 4 a.m. in some cases, uh, you're a farmer, you're not sleeping. Um, you get an hour or two of sleep and then you've got to wake up and go do a lot of hard manual labor in the fields all day. So it's very disruptive to the workers in the region. Um, additionally, the loud noise keeps a lot of the uh, predatory animals away. 
um, coyotes and the like, or bobcats that right. that typically come to the ranches at night. They kind of keep the uh, the moles and the rats under control. So the farmers are starting to uh, experience problems with some of these uh, invasive pests because they're not being eaten, <laughs> right. to, to put it bluntly, by the coyotes. <laughs> so, so the noise issue and the light pollution um, is is definitely an issue. Now, as far as that is concerned, I mean, is I know that there's the noise pollution and the light pollution. I mean, that is that is a big draw for the VA is that there are so many incredible um, events that happen. So what is the what is the proposition to find a balance there? Right. Well, currently, there's kind of a gentleman's agreement. Uh, it, first of all, to let everybody know, there, there really are no laws in regard to regulation uh, in the Valle de Guadalupe. And that's the problem, because what we're starting to see now is a lot of development uh, already happening, as well as a lot of upcoming, even bigger projects that are coming to the Valle. And if they're not regulated, this could be um, very, very detrimental, if not deadly, uh, to the Valle de Guadalupe, which, which really affects anybody who likes to go there and enjoy the wine region. Well, um, I know that, So, uh, you know, each time I just drive down the road, whether I'm coming from the free road or I'm coming off of the toll road, I am amazed at, at the new things that I see off the side of the road. I mean, I, I'm constantly seeing brand new, uh, you know, uh, restaurants that I haven't seen before or little ones that, you know, are, are in the midst of being built or, you know, new Airbnbs and things. I am constantly amazed at how quickly uh, some of these smaller projects are, are being put together. So I can't imagine, I, mean, I just, I can't imagine from what I love about the Valle, a massive monster hotel going in, um, right. you know, but what is that going to do to, I mean, we live in a desert. We know that mm -hmm. we live in a desert. The water is an issue, I'm sure, but farming <laughs> takes a lot of water. <laughs> it, it does, and right right now, most of the water there's a natural aquifer uh, in the Valle de Guadalupe. It's it's rapidly being uh, depleted. Uh, right now, most of the majority of water is going going to the vineyards uh, for irrigation use, and a lot of people in town are getting two three hours of municipal water per week. Uh, and then they're forced to buy water from water trucks uh, to kind of make up the difference. So, so you're there's talking definitely about the local a, population as well, not just the wineries and the businesses, but the local population of of the farmers and those who work the land and have to live in the or who have always lived in the area. Correct, and, and I mean, really, when you think about it, these people are probably the most important in the entire equation. They've been there uh, sometimes for generation. I mean, there's been uh, cultivation of vines and winemaking happening in, in that area since the late 1800s. Uh, and then in the 1900s, the Russians came and, and cultivated more of the land. So you have people who, who for generations have been working the farms and working the vineyards there. There are three small towns uh, um, there in the Valle de Guadalupe. There's San Antonio de las Minas, mm -hmm. uh, there's El Porvenir, and then there's Guadalupe, which some people know as Francisco Sarco. And you drive through these towns, and you may not think that, hey, there's people that live here. It's all about the restaurants and the wineries. Uh, but there is a there is a population there, and they kind of have their own little setup. They go to their own restaurants, uh, and they, they work very hard in the field. So they're being impacted uh, by this uh, uh, kind of threat of rampant development from a water shortage standpoint, uh, and then also from a garbage collection standpoint. And that inadvertently leads to the fire problems they've been having. There was a fire just about every week uh, in the, on the kind of around the rim of the Valle de Guadalupe uh, this summer. A lot of what's happening is since trash isn't being collected because there's no money uh, being spent on trash collection, the locals who live in the Valle are burning their trash, and then that sparks a wildfire. So that's, that's a big problem for the local uh, population as well. And Scott, I've just put um, Sherry... Uh, has uh, told us that uh, she currently has no water on tap right now, and she lives in Francisco Zarco. Oh, hi, hi, Sherry. Yeah, I, I, I have never met Sherry, but we're friends on Facebook, and we have a lot of communication. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and Sherry, uh, I, I believe, is an expat oh. uh, who lives in the area, too. So uh, you've got the expats kind of experiencing what some of the local Mexican population there uh, are experiencing as well. Now, is there a voice being heard from the local Mexican population on some of these issues at this point? 
You know, uh, uh, Provino and the groups, uh, it, it, again, it's Provino's part of it, but not uh, the head of this. They're just kind of spearheading the public relations effort. Uh, they are, they are going to start working with the uh, town councils. Um, one of the problems there is, uh, for instance, the El Porvenir Town Council, uh, some of the members are on strike right now because they're not being paid money uh, coming from the municipal- municipality to the townships there uh, is an issue. So, so I think uh, there was a meeting a couple of weeks ago, Eileen told me, and uh, seven out of 11 of the town council who were supposed to vote on whatever issues you know the month were uh, didn't show up. So they didn't even have enough people for a quorum. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But but yes, of of course the uh, uh, the business people would love to work uh, with the local people and with the local the township councils to make sure that they're okay with uh, with these regulations as well because ultimately they're going to be the ones that are affected. Now, the most. what is the, is there some sort of solution for? Um, I mean, some of these resources that you say that they're lacking. I mean, how? I can't imagine that trash is going to be an easy, <laughs> you yeah. know, is, a, is an easy solution, especially if if developers come in and create a lot of that trash, um, mm-hmm. you know, along with a lot more visitors. I mean, currently, I know that I go in, and, and there are a few locations in the Valle where I will be driving by, and there are some massive buses of people in parking lots where you know. I, I love to see that there are a lot more people crossing the border and coming to visit Valle. That's not the issue. But, I mean, this just speaks to what we can expect in the future, I would assume, if there are bigger developments, correct? Uh, one would think so. But but then again, uh, look at it this way. You know, the local population may not be being helped. Mm-hmm. But if you're a you know, multi-million dollar, uh, uh, say, resort uh, company, for example, um, I imagine that the municipality would step it up and make sure that their trash was collected. So, so I, yeah, I don't think it's going to be an issue for a lot of the businesses <laughs> okay. so much as it is and could be worse for uh, the townspeople. Now, in addition to the trash collection, there's also uh, other infrastructure sh- uh, shortages currently. Um, I was working with the El Porvenir Fire Department and still need to work with them a little more Uh, It's an all-volunteer department in El Porvenir. They're the only fire service in the Valle de Guadalupe. And again, they had a fire every week uh, this past season. And they're such a small, uh, under-equipped, but very dedicated fire service. But they just don't have the resources, manpower, uh, or modern equipment to fight some of these wildfires that they're seeing. So Eileen was telling me, and I remember hearing this from Drew Deckman a couple years ago, when there's a fire, when it starts to encroach on the Valle, Uh, they'll actually form literally a bucket brigade and put out the fires themselves. Eileen said at one point they were actually having a class every Sunday that all the local business people would attend uh, to learn how to fight the fires. So, so that's, that's an issue. Uh, Another issue is there's, there's really no medical facility in the Valle de Guadalupe. The nearest hospital is in in Ensenada. Eileen was telling me the story of a guest, an elderly guest they had, I think about a month ago. Um, who was had just had her medication changed? She went into cardiac arrest. Oh my gosh. Instead of Eileen knew, you know, why even bother calling the ambulance when it may not even get here, and if it does, it's going to be too late. So they actually put her in their car and took her down to Ensenada to get medical treatment themselves. Well, that's so scary. It, I mean, yeah. That's very scary. So imagine if you've got, uh, you know, a lot of people are going there now. I don't know what the numbers are, but imagine doubling and then tripling or quadrupling. The amount of people that are coming to the Valle, uh, and then you have these very limited medical resources. Um, people inevitably, as you have more people drinking wine mm-hmm. uh, or visiting some cantinas or late night parties, right. there's going to be more people drinking and driving on the road, and that presents a problem. So imagine, you know, a, a major accident uh, right. where you know half a dozen people are hurt. Are they going to get medical attention in time? Right. You know, so so the the medical and fire. Uh, are, are a big infrastructure problem. And as you know, some of those roads aren't well lit. Uh, the Highway 1 going up uh, into El Porvenir is very narrow. Right. And uh, there's a lot of kind of obstacles in regard to places having parking lots uh, very close to or right off the road. Um, you know, sometimes I know even just during the day, dead sober, because we don't drive drunk. Right. You know, I, I have to kind of peek out you know, yeah. and hope that hope that somebody's not coming before I pull out into the road. Absolutely. Um, so, so these are things that really a lot of us may not consider, but are really problems right now. Well, so is 
so the the request for you know certain legislation to go through is any of this addressing the need for the municipality to help fund some of this infrastructure that is lacking or non-existent uh, of course i think there's always been kind of ongoing uh dialogue with the municipality to increase you know as tourism increases and more tax money mm -hmm. is coming in i mean their uh wineries are taxed 50 percent wow uh on their wine you know, uh, Eileen told me that they pay a 19% uh, uh, hotel tax. Right. Um, they pay a 3% tourist tax, you know, and that's supposed to be money that promotes them. So there's a lot of taxes being paid into the municipality right now. And uh, they're hoping that some of those those tax dollars are put to work a little bit more, perhaps, than they are now in the Valle de Guadalupe. Wow. So, I mean, you've, you've spoken a lot about a few of the figures that are, um, that are, that are very vocal right now um are we hearing are we hearing uh from the other side from the developer side at all are they chiming in or are they kind of keeping low key in some of this <laughs> until right you know right well you know what one thing i've been very careful not to do in the communication that mm -hmm. i've put out there so far uh is not to name names because right. there are people uh there are places right now that would be in violation if there were regulations in place okay. uh, and there are also new projects coming online uh, that could be in violation, but we don't know that they will be. I mean, maybe some of these places will come in and they'll have uh, their own water systems or their own treatment plants, and 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 they'll be responsible uh, citizens and 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 places in the vibe. You know, that's always up in the air, especially when it comes to money and development. Uh, also, some of the places now that would be in, in violation if there were regulations, uh, you know, will start possibly coming into compliance as well. So. You know, but but if there's no regulations in place, then what's to stop, stop uh, say, a casino from oh. coming into the Valle de Guadalupe? Right. You know, there's there's just it's it's the Wild West at this point. <laughs> and the concern is, is if this uh, development goes unchecked and unregulated and runs rampant, it's going to be the end of the Valle de Guadalupe as we know it. And, and right. maybe from an environmental standpoint, the end of it, period. Right. right. Some, you know, some years down the road, it can only sustain so much. Right. Wow. You know, and, yeah. I, and I think that it was an important conversation for me when when I read some of the stuff, because I, I don't I don't know these numbers and I'm sure Provino probably has these numbers, but a large percentage of the tourism, I'm sure, comes from stateside. And I know here, especially right at the border, especially Southern California, well, all through California, for sure, um, we are up in arms about sustainability. It's one of the mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of the constant conversations we have, conservation. You know, we hear a lot about the conservation um, in uh, the Sea of Cortez and these types of things. And so I was really concerned that, you know, the, the conversation happening about a place that so many of our uh, local um, Californians frequent, and I know it's mm -hmm. got to be a lot of them, <laughs> you, yeah. know, yes. uh, you know, haven't had the opportunity to sort of hear about what's going on. And... Not that I feel that, you know, they have any say, really, but people do, especially in, in California, show their support or lack of in dollars uh, and in mm. dollars that they they choose to spend. And for me, it was important that we all know so that if there is something that we can do to make sure that, uh, you know, we support a particular uh, way of of. Valle's particular or present culture, I think that I think that especially on the American tourism side, we'd like to know how mm -hmm. we can do that. So, what are some of the things that you feel that the visitors from stateside can keep in mind when they are visiting Valle de Guadalupe? Right. Well, you know, the the number I've heard, uh, Marie, mm -hmm. is that about fifty percent of the the current tourism uh, in the Valle de Guadalupe is coming from the U.S., a lot of it from Southern California, okay. uh, but also from all over the U.S. So some of the things that, that uh, I didn't even get into one other issue before I go into what people can do sure. to kind of help the situation. Uh, one other is, uh, issue is land management, land use. Okay. And that's a big uh, portion of these regulations that will be put in place. Right now, uh, all the properties are designated uh, agricultural and development okay. zones. So say that you uh, own a property and it's, you know, 40% of it's for development, 60% uh, of it is for agriculture because it's an agricultural region, right? It has mm -hmm. been for almost 200 years. 
Um, so what most people are doing is being responsible. You can also only build one structure uh, for development on every four hectares. Okay. And these, these initial uh, you know, zoning rules, I don't know that they're necessarily laws, were put in place to stop rampant development from happening and for, uh, for vineyards being plowed down basically for hotels or restaurants or whatever. So those land use rules are also being threatened now because if you're a property owner uh, or you're a business owner and you're on a land that's zoned for, you know, again, 40 percent development, 60 percent uh, agriculture, what's going to stop you from turning that piece of land into 70 percent for development or 100 percent? Right. for development. So that's a big issue as well, because then, you know, who wants to see a wine region that's become a concrete jungle? I, I know I don't. And so has, so currently, if those rules are in place, is it being enforced right now? You know, that's a good question, Marie, and I, I, I can't say that it necessarily is being enforced. Mm -hmm. um, you've seen a lot of Airbnbs that kind of uh, scatter across the landscape now. Mm -hmm. I know those are unregulated uh, a lot of them are unzoned, and they even go untaxed. So I, I think there's, um, how can I say this, a blind eye mm -hmm. in some cases, uh, if you catch my meaning. Yep. And um, yes and no. I mean, I think your neighbors, you know, will remind you, hey, you know, you can't do this. But I don't know how much enforcement there is coming from the government because, again, there are no laws which these regulations hope to establish. Got it. Now, within this manifesto, um, what is the time frame for trying to get this, uh, this passed? I, I, I hear that it's quite urgent. Yeah, yeah, a good question, Marie. As I'd mentioned, uh, this set of regulations originally drafted by businesses in the Valle in conjunction with the Ensenada municipality uh, have been sitting on the uh, Congress's desk, essentially, since 2007. Wow. Um, what is this, 2019? <laughs> so for... 12 years, I, that's what, three or four different uh, changes of the guard when it comes to the government, uh, still unsigned. The current government, uh, the municipality as well as the state government uh, are out of office. Their term ends at the end of September. Okay. So there's an urgency to get, if not the full draft set of regulations, uh, at least a truncated stopgap version of the regulations put into place and signed into law before those folks leave office, because what's going to happen is that if they leave office, uh, it's going to have the process will have to start all over again. Wow. So the regulations will have to be re uh, presented to the new uh, to the new municipality and, and state government. Uh, they'll have to do new studies on the regulations. Uh, they have to have them published in a uh, Mexican legal journal. And only then do they become law. And that can take a while. So, you know. Provino has already done this three other times? It's not just that Provino's actually only gotten involved in the past two years. Okay. This is, this is, these are groups of independent businesses in the Valle who really are concerned about the Valle and the, and the future of the Valle uh, who got together, you know, back in 2007 to put these together. Uh, Provino is, is really helping with the PR now, but there's a lot okay. of people involved in the movement, uh, like Roberto Alcacer, who mm -hmm. I'd mentioned earlier, who aren't even part of Provino. Okay. There's another loosely affiliated group, and, and they have a Facebook page. It's um, uh, por, por Un Valle de Verdad, and that's mm -hmm. for One True va Valle. And I know Drew Deckman is a big part of that, and I believe Hugo de Acosta is as well. Uh, they are the ones who put out the manifesto today. Okay. So there's you've got two you know, fairly influential, as influential mm -hmm. as they can be, given the situation in the Valle, working toward this with a lot of other independent people. Now, tell me about the signs. What is the deal with the signs? Yeah. You know, when the signs started coming down, the, the buzz was, uh, wow, do we really even need wayfinding signs? But, but what it really <laughs> was was more uh, of a sign of unity okay. uh, between these groups, between these winemakers and these restaurant owners to take the signs down. And, and it's, it's kind of, um, how can I, it's, it's like a, analogous with something larger. You know, they're cleaning up. Uh, this visual pollution, right? You know, so it's, it's it was really a sign of them coming together and showing uh, that they're solidarity. They're, solidarity. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, you know, and everybody's now. Well, do we need the blue signs? Are the blue signs <laughs> ugly? You know, I mean, you can put in you can put in better way. I, I think what happened with the signs is uh, I remember when they first started going in, and I believe the restaurants and the wineries and the hotels had to pay the municipality 
uh, a decent sum of money for these signs. When they first started going in, and there were you know three, four, five signs on any given corner, yeah. not a big deal. But what's happened now, and you've seen this, you'll go to <laughs> in the Valle and see 20 of these signs, different and heights, and it does not different help colors, you. different I mean, typefaces. <laughs> because you're flying yeah, I mean, by and there's so many, you yeah. don't know which one you're supposed to be looking at because there's so many there. I do hope they find a solution, though, because I do remember the days when there were no signs. And I right. could find nothing because everything, you know, d d was not there. Were, there were not so many big markers. So I do remember the days where everybody would tell me, for instance, to go to Doña Stella's. I couldn't find Doña Stella. There was a tiny <laughs> little wooden sign on the ground, you know, and I remember uh -huh. Andrew Spurgeon would tell me, just look for the little sign. I'm like, well, not <laughs> when I'm driving and I'm going over topes and like I couldn't I could never find Doña Estela. So I understand the need for the sign. So I do hope they come up with some sort of solution. Because... Yeah. Well, you, you know, it's, it's interesting because I'm a graphic designer. That's how I make my my mm -hmm. living. I don't I don't really make. Uh, in fact, I don't make a living at, at being a gringo in Mexico. That just basically supports my lifestyle and my and my Baja habit. Um, but uh, uh, as a graphic designer, you know, I, I went out after I heard about the signs. I looked at some wayfinding systems in other places. In Napa, uh, Napa Valley, for example, mm -hmm. they have a single post. They've got signs going this way on it, signs going that way on it. Uh, very uniform, very easy to read. Uh, you can look at it and at a glance know how to get to Firestone Winery, for instance. Um, but with the visual clutter now, I mean, you've got to really yeah. scan those <laughs> signs. And how can you do it without stopping? Right. You know, and then you're stopping the road looking at these signs. Somebody comes up behind you and yeah. bam. And it, you know, is a so one, it's, it so, could be a road hazard. And anybody that has not been there, by the way, it is one, it is a single lane each direction. So there is, you know, it, and people that are familiar with the road drive quite fast so if you are new to the valle you know you're kind of you know chugging along a little bit you know um so i can't imagine i can't imagine uh not having signs but i i hope that they come up with some really great solution that does not necessarily uh interfere um you know let's hope so but i think right now the signs are really the least <laughs> the least of their yeah, problems in true. the valle um, but but again, it was a sign of solidarity from the people involved in this movement to get these regulations passed. Hopefully, you know, in the next what? When is October first? It's coming up early next week. So I mean, I I I know right now that Fernando Perez Castro uh, is in Mexico City, and they're trying to get the word out to the national Mexican press. Hopefully, to uh, influence a lot of the parties involved okay. to get these regulations passed in some form sooner versus later before the government goes out of office in what a week wow now that's yeah, yeah that's quite a deadline um so does anybody have any kind of inkling as to why it has been such a struggle to have each one of these uh, you know groups of terms in office to really kind of jump onto this um you know, let your imagination run wild on that. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to say, because, I, 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 again, I, I don't want to get um, politically involved. And mm -hmm. if I'm going to be kind of helping this movement north of the border, I don't want to say uh, or, or misrepresent anything. Sure. Um, but let's just say that sometimes there are conflicting interests. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is the same no matter where you are. I don't think it matters which side of the border you're on. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that that can definitely be an issue. Indeed. Well, Indeed. Now, um, does anybody out there that's uh, on right now have any questions for Scott and what he has, uh, what he has uh, come up with over this last uh, last week in his adventures to uh, a bunch of different parties? Or anybody have anything to to add that maybe we missed? We'd love you to chime in. Um, and this will stay up after after the live is over. You know, um, feel free to comment even after the fact because I feel like this conversation can definitely keep going and it will con continue. And uh, even after uh, the week is up and after October 1st, I have a feeling there's going to be a whole lot more to say uh, <laughs> about the matter. Um, mm -hmm. How are you feeling about it, Scott? I know that it, it you've you've brought a lot of attention to this and, and I know mm -hmm. that there's kind of a lot of pressure on you to sort of get the word out in English too, I'm sure, because you've been really the only right. source. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny because, I mean, I kind of took that up on, up on myself. I was like, well, you know, people here may not are not going to know that this, this is going on unless they're 
bilingual or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Spanish as a first language living in the States. Um, and they know to go to Provino's website to see this. I saw all of the promotion for the regulations just because I'm a regular in the Valle. Uh, they consider me part of the community, again, mm -hmm. even though I don't live there. Uh, and I follow all of these folks online. So I saw their plea. So I kind of took it on myself to go ahead and, and, and start talking about this uh, in the English language so that uh, you know everybody here north of the border knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. So to that end, I did put together, Marie, kind of going back to what we were talking about before, um, some, some I guess, tips or some things that you can do to help. Mm -hmm. Hold on just and, a uh, second. So Tanya, I, you know, I think she says, do you think it's even close to possible to get this signed in a week? Um, I think it's, I, I think that's a lot to ask. It's a lot to ask. But again, if it's not this full set of regulations, at least something that's a stopgap before it's too late mm -hmm. uh, and a development comes in that changes things uh, not for the better. So I, I, I don't know. I know that the, the, the people in the Valle and Provino and the uh, folks at Un uh, uh, Valle de Verdad uh, are work, or Port Un Valle uh, de Verdad are working very hard uh, and very tirelessly. They've had several meetings in Ensenada. I attended one of them last week. Um, you know, they're trying to work uh, with the municipality, with the governor of Baja California also okay. to get these signed. And the manifesto that went out today basically said, you know, we need these politicians to sign this now, you know, please, here's why we need it done. Uh, here's what will happen. We're afraid if it doesn't get done, it's a good thing. I think for everybody involved, the one thing everybody agrees on is that some sort of regulation is needed. Mm -hmm. um, so is it going to be done in a week? I, I have no idea. Well, you Wendy, Wendy, Wendy Lemlin's on. Um, hi, Wendy. Hey, Wendy. She says, you know, there needs to be a moratorium on such water wasting things as swimming pool construction, you know, and, and, <laughs> it is a big water waste, you know. I know that it is something that everybody loves too, you know. So I think things like that are mm -hmm. going to be a, com a, a a complicated conversation too, um, you know. And and so I think there's a lot to consider here. Uh, Laura right. is on, and Laura says, um, "Is there anything we can do from the U.S. side of the border to help, even raising funds for the local fire department, etc." Well, you know, I, I am planning on donating proceeds for my book, Seven Days in the Valle, uh, to the El Porvenir Fire Department. I was working with them on this about a year ago. Uh, we kind of stopped in the middle because everybody got busy. Um, they didn't have the, the accounting infrastructure in place um, to take the money at the time, but I've got it saved up and, mm -hmm. and, and earmarked to go to them. So when you do go to the Valle de Guadalupe, uh, you will see Captain Lucas from the El Porvenir Fire Department uh, in El Porvenir on a street corner there, and they've got their, their firefighting boots out, and they take right. money. So you can always, you know, drop, drop, uh, you know, white coins, drop some peso bills mm -hmm. in those. That can help. Um, support, uh, going down, I kind of got my list of, of things you can do. Um, if you, you know, again, I'm not going to name any names, but the, right. the research is out there if you want to go look, look for it. If it's in Spanish language, you can translate on Facebook by hitting the See Translate button. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's a right. web article, you can go enter the URL into Google Translate, and they'll translate it in English for you. Keep up with some of what's happening uh, on the latest developments. Take the time to do a little bit of research. If there are businesses currently or coming in uh, that you don't feel are really doing best practices as far as as far as uh, managing their land mm -hmm. wisely diminishing natural resources uh, don't don't go to those places you know don't spend your dollars there um, if, if there's somebody that's damaging if there's a business that's damaging the environment for example um, we're starting to see ATVs yes. all terrain vehicles off-road in the Valle de Guadalupe uh, not only are they noisy um, you know, they can destroy the, the flora and the fauna and disturb the local wildlife as well. You know, there's certainly a place to have an ATV in Baja California. Go to okay. San Felipe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, go to points further south that are, are a little less populated. Right. Uh, and a little more sp sparse in, in regard to that. Um, so you want to keep your eye on that. Uh, stop the party at midnight. You know, if you're out and about, you're at one of these late events. Uh, everything should be shut down at midnight, and the new regulations call for it to be shut down at 10 o'clock. So right now, that gentleman's 
uh, agreement exists for midnight. But mm-hmm. if there's a place that's partying all night long and cranking the music and causing light pollution and blocking the night sky and disturbing the farmers and the workers, uh, don't, don't go to that place. Now, that's that's tough because I'm 52. <laughs> I'm a little older. I'm not going out night clubbing anymore. I haven't actually for a long time. It's really not my scene. But there's a lot of younger people coming to the Vi from both the U.S., Mexico right. City, Guadalajara, uh, Monterey, they want to they want to come and they want to go out and party. Well, well, it's certainly you know the do? trendy it, thing to do right now. I mean, well, there's been so many eyes on it coming from such large publications too that it is the place to be seen for sure. Right, but but the culture here is an agricultural. Mm-hmm. It's it's an agricultural place. You right. know, if, uh, Roberto Alcacer says, you know what? Why do you want to go out and party all night long in the Valle? Uh, oversleep, miss, mm-hmm. you know, eat a late breakfast, miss your, miss your first wine tasting appointment, go to the restaurant, try the food. It's going to taste horrible because you've got a dry mouth. Right. Uh, the, the wines aren't going to be any good and you're going to slag the wines, but it's not the wine. It's your taste buds because right. you've you know, been drinking tequila or, or whiskey all night, whatever. Um, th- there is a place, of course, for younger people to party. And that place is in Ensenada <laughs> uh, or Rosary. <laughs> Rito Beach or Tijuana. Absolutely. Those three places offer a, an abundance of nightlife options. So get a designated driver, go to those places if that's where you want to go to party. But if you want to come and enjoy a relaxed, laid back, uh, very natural, beautiful environment with some fantastic wines and food made of local sustainable ingredients that's just delicious, uh, go to the Valle. Yeah, absolutely. Sep- people have to separate those two activities, I think. Well, I loved, I can't find it at this moment in time, but what I really loved is the quote that you gave from Roberto, and I'm just going to uh, summarize, but his quote talking about what you should do when you come to Valle is go to your wine tasting, go to a beautiful dinner, eat the local food, have some wine, buy a bottle of wine during your wine tasting, take it back to your Airbnb, your hotel, your uh, boutique uh, hotel, and uh, sit outside, enjoy the stars and the nature that you're in, and make love. And I just thought, <laughs> that's exactly why you go to Valle. I mean, that yeah. he captured it all in that one quote, and I loved, I loved that he he put it so eloquently because that really is exactly what I am. I imagine the reasoning for wanting to go to Valle. So I was very happy to see, you know, um, see that quote. It was beautiful. Yeah. And, and that's the, when we go to the Valle, that's what we do all except for the make love part, because we've usually got my 11 year old son with us. So, yeah. uh, and we're all in the same room. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, yeah. so we've got a few, a few people chiming in here and, you know, Alex is saying, um, Napa and Paso Robles, they don't have places to party. And he's absolutely right. Not in the middle of the va- the valley, at least. You know, I know that when you do go to Napa and Paso Robles, you have to go into town. And yes, there is a section of town where you can go and you can drink in wine bars or in a regular bar or a tap room right. for, for local beers. But that's in town. It's it's um, it would be right. It would be like going into the middle of um, San Antonio de las Minas on the main road and, and enjoying that area for that type of environment, but not out in the middle of the fields and, and things. But um, Exactly. I mean, our, the equivalent of the town for the Valle de Guadalupe is right down the hill, 20 minutes away, there's Ensenada. You yeah. know, and if you want to party, really party hard, yeah. party, go there, stay there overnight and come back to the to the Valle the next morning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and, and the reason that Napa and Sonoma and Temecula and some of these other places uh, have control over the party scene is because all the local businesses and the local people who live there have worked with the government to put regulations in place. And that's one thing we don't have happening right now in the Valle de Guadalupe, unfortunately. Now, Elaine Masters is on. Hi, Elaine. Good to hey, see Elaine. you. She is asking, is anyone negotiating with the Ensenada port and cruise ships bussing the crowds into the Valle? Do you know anything about that, Scott? You know, I don't. Uh, that hasn't really been brought up in the meetings. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that, that, you know, the people coming off the cruise ships, they do, they do what is it? They, they call it the land tour or whatever mm-hmm. it's called. I'm, I'm not a cruise ship guy myself. I've got a friend uh, who runs tours from the cruise ships, but those folks, for the most part, the, the tours bring them into the Valle. They've probably already had breakfast on the boat. Right. They, they, they're driven, you know, by a sober, responsible, hopefully licensed tour company to the Valle. They do their wine tastings. Maybe they have a nice dinner <clears throat> and then they're, they're shuttled back, uh, again by the tour. So really 
they wouldn't be uh, that much of a consideration or really that much of a problem in regard to some of the issues we're talking about, other than if there's rampant development and uh, the natural resources are being diminished for those people when they get here. Right. Um, I've got a great thing from Teresa Brown here. I'll put up for you all to see. She says, hey, Teresa. <laughs> take a bottle of wine, head to see the sunset at Punta Moro or Planta Baja or somewhere beautiful after a wine day in the Valle. Great suggestion, Teresa. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sounds good to me. Let's do it. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I love Ensenada. Ensenada has its charms. A um, lot of great restaurants. Right. A uh, lot of nice bars. There's a really good wine shop, uh, uh, Cava Macias on the on the Malacón there. Right. Uh, there's Muy mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just there's a lot Tatoni to do. There's and yes, Ensenada. Not, yeah, there's Tatoni. fantastic uh, restaurants. Yeah. There's we discovered. Uh, I think it's called Via. In Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Villa Mexico, when we were there last weekend, and it's it's kind of this older area of shops, and it's kind of like an, a maze of alleyways, and it was okay. shut down for a few years. I'm not sure what it was used for before, uh, but it's starting to come back up. So you're going to find wine shops, uh, restaurants, and bars starting to pop up in that area as well. It's a nice little party center, and I like this kind of part, well, entertainment center, right. and I'd like to see it start coming into its own because uh, it's a really unique space. It's in the city. Now, Laura uh, says she's heard uh, that Dream Hotel is planned for the Valle. Do you know anything about that? She's scared for what it might bring to the Valle. Um, all I know is that they're proposing, uh, uh, it's proposed to be built uh, on the land of Bruma. Uh, the, the proposal, I believe, is 88 uh, hotel rooms, 50 houses. And I don't know if those are rented or their timeshares or how that's going to work. Uh, three restaurants and a conference center. That's big. Yes, it's, <laughs> it's is, very big. That is I, big. I do know I saw somewhere where they're planning on doing this in an eco-friendly way, and they'll be, okay. I believe, treating gray water and everything for irrigation. But, uh, you know, of course, when, a, when when something that big happens, there's always the potential uh, for some kind of encroachment on the resources or the environment. But we don't know that yet. Right. You know, there's a lot of assurances being given, uh, and they may come in and do everything right. People in the Valle who are there now say, we know there's going to be development that's going to happen. We don't want to stop development. Hell, we can't stop development. But if somebody's going to come in here and uh, set up in the Valle de Guadalupe, they really need to do it right and they need to be respectful uh, of their neighbors of the and of the environment and of the local culture. Right. And I think that that would really be a shame if the local culture uh, were to be lost because, one, they can't afford to stay. Uh, two, Correct. Uh, you know, it's just it's not feasible any longer because the resources aren't them aren't there for them. And then, you know, what that does to the working population, I mean, it just I know that it's a struggle to even find enough people to to run the businesses that are currently there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so I really do hope that this this next round does, as you say, put a stopgap of some sort. And I hope that the incoming uh, government uh, recognizes that this is mm -hmm. this is a pivotal point for them, and right. this this could be what makes or breaks them. You know, I, I have been told that the incoming uh, municipal administration have recommended to the current on their way out administration that they do sign some form of the regulation. So there is hope. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, there's always hope. <laughs> you can always, you can always hope. And you know, and I know that there is a great deal of um, of of push and importance from the current uh, wineries, boutique hotels, um, you know, and the Airbnb population that really wants to have something in place. They may not all agree on exactly what it is, but I think that they can all mm -hmm. agree that some sort of uh, agreement that is uh, put into law will give the guidance that they will need so that they can grow and all you know prosper and profit including the local population and bring some of those resources to uh, El Porvenir and to San Antonio de las Minas and to Francisco Zarco so you know we'll be following this along with you I hope that you know after the first maybe we can get a little update can we take some of your time to kind of talk about what happens after the fact uh -huh. 
Absolutely. I'm self-employed, so uh, in between projects, I've got plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us this evening. I know 6 o'clock on a Monday is an odd time, but I figure uh, we wanted to make sure that you had enough time to come home from work, relax a little bit with the family, and maybe jump on and talk to us. Um, please go ahead and put any questions or comments that you like in, in the comments over the next following days. Scott and I both will be uh, looking at them and, um, and responding, and we hope to talk to you in a week and a half or so and maybe we'll uh have a little more news that'll be good news at least we can hope let's hope so uh, eileen is doing a, a very good job as an intermediary between the folks in the via that are doing this uh and me we we've probably spoken a total of two and a half hours on the on the phone so far yeah. uh, and then of course i spoke to her in, in uh and so not at the meeting last week so yeah we'll keep our eyes on this and then marie you also said you're going to edit an archive Yes. This video, I believe. So it will live on. If you didn't get to see this tonight, uh, you can still see it and catch up with, with this conversation. Absolutely. And we're also going to go ahead and take the, um, the audio and put it as an audio podcast so that anybody that would like to be, you know, seeing if they can't view it because they're on a long drive, for instance, or something of the sort, they can just pop on their headphones. And as they're going about their day, they can listen to the, uh, you know, to the podcast. So we'll put all the links inside of the description uh, once we get them up. Oop. Um, and, you know, if there's anything else that anybody would like from us, just go ahead and uh, populate a conversation. Reach out to Scott directly if, if he can help you with anything. And, you know, let's all do our very best to make sure that we, we keep the Valle um, in its true nature and what, it, what it's meant to, to exude in the, in the area. You know, they make some really beautiful wines. So that's what they're there to do. They're there to promote the food, the wine, the culture. Let's see what we can do to keep it that way. All right, everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, Scott, thank you so much for your time today, everybody. We will talk to you in a couple Thanks, weeks. Thanks, Marie. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. All right. Bye, guys. Hey there. You still there? Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. I do appreciate it. If you enjoyed today's interview, go ahead and give us a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. And we'll go ahead and notify you the next time we have a new upload. Okay? Thanks so much. We'll see you the next time.